you're talking about um, public companies and the accounts of resource companies. In reality, we don't do anything financial. What do we do and why are you here? Because what I have to try and sell you tonight is I sell you mystery, not history. What we're going to talk about is the mystery of, of resources. And I sell you hope, not reality. So the accounts are some kind of historical reality and they're really irrelevant. So they, as long as you have cash to keep going, that's all you need to know. Um, diamonds are a very interesting um, area. I'll go forward a little bit. This is the disclaimer, which you need to know. There'll be a copy of everything. Um, they are very difficult, in fact, probably the most difficult of all to find. Probably about 1 in 2,500 is the chance. If you take gold to be 1 in 500 from a greenfield site. Diamonds are about maybe 1 in 2,500. Um, we set up a company in 2002. I know some of you were involved in it. It's called African Diamonds. And we had a, a discovery in 2004 in Botswana with joint venture with De Beers. And it comes on stream this month. For those of you who have shares in Lucara, it was bought out by the Lundin Group in Lucara in 2010. So uh, the mine comes on stream this month. First sales of diamonds. They wouldn't sell the initial diamonds. It would be sometime in May. It should do very well. It was very hard to have to sell it. We couldn't finance the full development of the mine. We had 40% of it. If you were in early enough, we listed the company at seven. And the takeout was about 70 pence. It could have been more, but greed and stupidity and delays. It was about 70 pence after eight or nine years. And a, a share, one for one, in Botswana Diamonds. So what they did is they bought the company for shares in, in, in Lucara, a Canadian company. And they gave each of you as shareholders, or each of our shareholders, one share in Botswana Diamonds, which was the exploration interests. So what we're hoping to do with this is to, do, is to repeat it. Now, we learned a lot in 10 years, and, and in fact, in resources, I've been resources for about 40 years. Um, we've done OK over the years. I know some faces here have been with us for quite a long time. Um, not everything worked brilliantly, but then we're in an uncertain business. So what we have here now, three areas. Our focus is in Botswana, clearly, and I'll explain that to you in a little while. We have an interesting development in Cameroon, and in the last six or eight weeks, though you say a little bit in Zimbabwe, it looks to me as if Zimbabwe is opening up, and the possibilities there are really vast. It's very high risk, but it's going to be the biggest diamond producer in the world later this year. So as I go on to it there, that we listed last year, a market cap of about five and a half million, um, 4p share price. We have probably, we hold ourselves, the directors hold 25%, close Family, about 40% in total. Uh, West House um, uh, is the broker in Dublin, uh, the nomad and the broker in London, and we're listed in Botswana. And capital securities are there. It hasn't been that great a thing yet. Um, what I would like to do is pass you over to Robert, who is our director, and he'll take you through the markets, and then I'll come back and do the projects. I'm going to talk to you about the diamond market and what's happened over the last year or so, and what's likely to come forward in, in the market. No surprise to any of you that uh, the diamond industry is selling luxury goods, non-essential luxury items, uh, is not immune to global macroeconomic issues. However, what's happened is that the growth in India and China has actually saved the industry over the last few years. You've seen a 10 to 20 percent, sorry, louder. You've seen a, a 10 to 20 percent annual growth in consumer demand in the emerging markets. And this has actually propelled the diamond industry going forward in terms of the ability to price the rough that's produced from the mines. So I think it's fair to say that China and India principally have actually kept the diamond industry fairly healthy from a, a sales perspective. You'll see a chart in a moment which shows you how prices have evolved from the pre-crisis 2008 to where we are today. And I'll show you that in a moment. Suffice to say that there was a massive rebound in prices. A bubble formed pre the financial crisis at the end of 2008. The market then crashed, but it was very short-lived. Within six months, rough prices started to rebound, and rebound very quickly. In fact, they went to prices, levels in the industry that we'd never seen before. Okay, so there was a short-term paralysis in the, in the industry. Liquidity dried up. Nobody could buy. Nobody could sell. Very quickly, that turned around. By April 2009, the market took off. You'll see that in a moment. Overall, the diamond industry, we see the market. There are very few new diamond mines coming on stream. The big one that's happened recently, which I'm sure many of you have read about, is Morangue in Zimbabwe. A bit unknown, a bit unquantifiable, lots of issues that you read about in the press. 
but the actual volume of diamonds that have been coming out from Zimbabwe and is coming out uh, is very significant. Yeah. Almost the same size as the production from Botswana, which is the world's biggest individual producer. So huge. Um, in terms of kimberlite mines, there are, it's, it's surprising, but there are only about 15 kimberlite mines in the world. Okay, so there's not a lot of it going on. This is what happened and what I was talking about. So prices, fairly steady, grew during 2008 very quickly. We were seeing 15%, 20% price increases month on month. You don't normally see this in the diamond industry. It's much more stable. In the old days, De Beers would control the market much more. Prices were more steady. There wasn't a lot of sort of renegade behavior happening. By October 2008, the market suddenly turned overnight. Those people who were selling diamonds through tenders suffered a, a dramatic fall in prices. Um, you know, in some cases, 50% drop in price from one week to the next. Other producers took different approaches to the market. The Russians, Arosa, they were allowed to sell to the Gokran, government in the east of Russia. Intergovernmental trading saved a billion dollars of rough hitting the market cheaply and bringing down the whole market. De Beers cut production by 93% in the first half of 2009. Another factor that saved the diamond and kept the diamond market healthy. As I said, by April 2009, suddenly prices start to take off. And as you, I think there's a laser here. And as you can see, prices went to un, unparalleled levels, actually. The last few months, we've seen some volatility in the market, which has brought prices down again. But prices are still at a very high and healthy historical level. In terms of uh, consumer markets, which is the end of what we call the diamond pipeline, the US remains, of course, a key uh, consumer market. This is a report from Bain that came out in December 2011. Uh, estimating around $25 billion consumer market. What does that mean? It means the diamond content within the jewelry that's sold to consumers. Um, what's really important to note is that China and India are just accelerating. Uh, a very rapidly increasing middle class, changing consumer tastes, a westernization in the cultures in these countries. People want diamond jewelry. By the end of this decade, China and India combined will be bigger than the US. Okay, so that's driving the industry and keeping uh, the future looking very healthy. Japan, which used to be the same size as the US in terms of value, 33% of the global market each, remains around 10%. And Europe is within others. The reason it's here, I think, is this document was produced for um, an Arosa IPO by Bain. But Europe, static, but still there, around 10% of the world's market. There is a view by, held by everyone in the industry that there will be a supply-demand imbalance which will create a necessary pull in prices. There are not a lot of new supplies coming on stream, so uh, the demand that is coming from the east of, of the map is actually going to pull up the prices of, of our rough and polished diamonds going forward. I hope you can hear me at the back. It's okay? A little louder. Uh, global rough production. Just to tell you a little bit about what, what we see, the one sort of unknown is Marange and Zimbabwe which is not actually in this chart. Estimate is about 135 million carats a year produced by all producers in the world, which equates to about $12 billion US. Add in the Marangi, which is now really pumping out production from four concessions uh, in the east of Zimbabwe, you've probably got about $14 billion worth of goods okay, being produced uh, this year. I think that's stuck. Okay, that, that's it on the market. Let me go back a little bit and maybe uh, yeah, go back to that one and tell a couple of stories about a man, and it's nearly always, uh, was all, nearly always men, buys a diamond three times in his life. Usually he's quite young and it's a small diamond and it's a big part of his income and he buys that when he gets engaged. The second time he's probably in his 40s or early 50s, he buys a much bigger diamond. It's a big part of his income and he buys it for his mistress. The third time he buys a diamond is in his 40s or his 50s. He buys a very big diamond, and it's a very big part of his income. He buys it for his wife when she finds out about his mistress. <laughs> um, the, other, the other interesting thing is about, about the US here. This is supposed to be serious. I get serious in a minute. Um, some of you uh, will know it's still huge. It's still very big. And one of the amazing uh, uh, developments in the US market in the last 10 years is women buying diamonds and buying big diamonds. And these are women that are either divorced, widowed, separated, or else just bored with their husbands. And 
The other uh, interesting point here is about China. Um, one of the very best ads I've ever seen in my life was produced by De Beers in China. And uh, it was presented at a conference in, in Botswana a couple of years ago. And it was so good that the audience demanded to see it a second time. It was just a fabulous ad. And it was the usual thing, this beautiful Chinese lady. And the guy comes up and, uh, you know, he has, he has the little box. So she's expecting things like this. And remember, the 650 million Chinese women. That's a lot of diamonds. That is more diamonds than there are in the world, by the way. That's why there's the shortage. There are not 650 million uh, gem quality engagement ring diamonds. They just don't exist. And so he opens the box and there's only a piece of red thread on it. She's singularly unimpressed. But he puts the red thread on her hands, a little bow, and he pulls her along and she goes along with him and he walks along through this area, he walks around the corner and disappears. She goes around the corner and he's gone but the red thread has gone up to this sparkling tree, and on the tree, it's tied to it, coming down along the thread is this beautiful big diamond, which slips naturally, perfectly onto her finger. It's a magnificent ad. And for those of us who haven't worked that much in the Far East, um, which is probably most of us, it's hard to believe that there is a huge middle class, that it's there. And they are going to drive this industry, totally. You add to that 700 million Indians, 600 million Indian ladies who want diamonds, different types of diamonds because it's in gold jewellery. And they're the ones who are going to buy the Zimbabwe diamonds and are buying the Zimbabwe diamonds. You add Korea. In fact, we'll be talking about a Korean diamond mining comp company, which is almost an oxymoron. It's almost a contradiction in terms. There are no Korean diamond mining companies in the world, except there is one in Cameroon. And they're looking for big diamonds. All of South America, and sooner or later it'll be Africa. So we're talking like the BRICS. And, and that's what's going to happen to it. But let me go forward from that so the demand is there. Best place to find diamonds is where there are diamonds. That's a stupid thing to say. You'll probably hear the same with nickel. It's where there is nickel or was nickel. Yep, that's where you'll find it. Botswana is the place, number one in the world, best quality diamonds in the world. Four of the biggest and best diamond mines. The Arapa mine is about, is the second biggest diamond producer in the world. The Zhuaneng mine is the best mine in the world of any type. Its gross margin is 94%. We say 80% there, but it's 94%. And they would say that this is a better, you'd rather have the Zhuaneng mine than the US mint. Why? Because it costs them seven cents to produce a US dollar. So they're only getting a net 93% margin. Zhuaneng is 94. Now, they don't tell you that it also costs seven cents to produce a $500 bill, but that would ruin the story. So we won't, we won't say that. But it's a fabulous mine. These are Debswana mines. Letlakani, very close to the Karoi mine, which we discovered, only about 6K away. Um, one million carats, very beautiful diamonds. And then finally, Damsha, which is four Kimberlites. We'll be talking about that in a second. Um, essentially, our mine comes on stream now. Our, our former mine comes on stream in this month. We have, this is the area, and I'll be a bit discreet because we're not allowed to use use the name, um, they'd rather not do it. We have th currently three exploration licenses, I'll talk about one of them. We have applications for three licenses. Uh, we're going to get one in the um, Letlakani area. The Gope ones could be difficult. Gope, for those of you who know Gem Diamonds, they're supposedly developing a mine in Gope, which is in the Kalahari in Botswana. Um, and that last point there, this point here, this is the mystery and the hope. If this works, you'll be getting a factor times your investment. Note if it works. Right. I can't tell you it will. I'll go on and see if we can show it to you. This is one of the operations we had. When we took over the exploration assets from African Diamonds and Lundin, they gave us three advanced stage projects, AK8, BK5, and AK9. We spent half of the money we raised on doing big bulk samples, thousands of tons, neither worked. Unfortunately, in exploration companies, it doesn't always work. This was late stage exploration. We hoped, we, they, were, they contained diamonds. We, we hoped we'd get sufficient diamonds that we'd be able to be a supplier to the new mine. Didn't work. We're left with this one. This is a very interesting, for those of you who know anything at all about it, that's a beautiful um, kind of depiction of what's that. This is, this is a deep um, a jumbo hole, one meter wide hole, which produced these uh, macro diamonds. Something wrong in that we have micro diamond grades of 85 to 100. That would be a fantastic operation given the value of diamonds in Botswana. That would be really valuable. Really, really fabulous. This wouldn't be. Two and a half to three. 
we've taken all of the information, we've examined it, we've re-examined it, we've had numerous consultants telling us what they're, and nobody knows. It's going to have to be an executive decision, do we drill another hole, probably somewhere in the middle here. At 360,000 sterling uh, dollars, US dollars to drill the hole, we might or we might not. That's where we are on that one, and that's an interesting one. It, it'd be reasonably high risk. Now, I'll go on, I'll show you this very quickly, and then go on and show you the map. This is with one of the world's biggest diamond companies. This is a company that has been very successful. Um, they prefer us not to mention their name, which is very difficult for us. Uh, what they're going to do is, they have a technology, a fairly simple technology, which they apply for diamonds in areas where there is a big overburden. They have discovered 10 diamond mines in areas up to 200 meters of overburden. And that is unique in the world. They're the only ones doing this. So they've decided that what they're going to do now is they're in their own country they're finished, they're going to Africa. The best place to find diamonds, as I said, is where there are, in Botswana. Botswana has a lot of sand. It has a lot of Kalahari sand. It also has some salt cover. And in areas like this, I'll go on and show you, what they've done is they have taken this particular area. We have taken this area. You will see these are all the licenses. It's a terribly difficult thing to read because we, we reduced it. These all are licenses. This is Arapa. This is the best place in the world for diamonds. All the mines I've talked about, with one exception, are here. The new mine is here. There are 77 kimberlites, all of which contain diamonds here. This area is empty. There are no licenses in this area. Part of the reason there's no license is because there's up to 100 meters of Kalahari sand. And it's very hard to use your techniques to get through the sand. On top of that, part of it around here is a thing called the Makadi Kadi pans. So the water comes for a couple of months a year and then evaporates and you've got a salt cover, the salt pans. And that also apparently reflects the geochem. Now, I'm not a geologist, so I hope nobody's going to pick me up. Um, it makes it extremely difficult to get good data. So what we have is we have about $35 million worth of data that we gathered with the beers before we found, or before, during, and after we found the mine in Botswana. We have given that to them. This is nearly all geo geophysical data. The very best, because De Beers only do the best of work. They have that data and they're putting it through their technology. We also now have got to get out and try and get the geochemical, the soil sampling, the soil samples, where they're going to analyze that as well. And their belief is that with their technology and using geophysical, they can identify anomalies in these areas up here. Um, the anomalies, their target is large, long-life kimberlites. And where they have the additional little twist on this is that these will be diamondiferous kimberlites. Hence, they need the soil samples because they say they can identify kimberlite mines. They, they come up from 180 kilometers in the ground, down in the Earth's mantle. And that's where the diamonds are first made. And they come up in volcanoes. A kimberlite's a small volcano. And so, as such, they believe that when it comes up and spews this stuff out, they will get diamond indicator minerals. Not the type of ones that you would have heard from John Gurney or from De Beers or from Rio or from BHP. Different types. So their belief, and they've 10 mines to prove it, they're the biggest diamond producer in the world, is that they can identify large kimberlite anomalies that are likely to be diamondiferous, and we think it's going to be up here. So this work is being done. It'll take maybe another six months. At that stage, they will have a series of targets. We will then apply for the licenses and we're beefing up our, our on-the-ground team in Botswana in terms of people who will be able to help us get the licenses quicker, um, both financial and, and, and uh, engineering and technical people in Botswana because it can take us six or nine months. So we expect to within, within six months to be able to say we're applying for licenses. We then will apply for licenses. If we get the licenses, then the work starts. And we, we require big money because it is expensive to work in these areas. The exploration is expensive, let there be no doubt about that. And it's a heads up, 50-50 joint venture. We're getting nothing, uh, we bring our 35 million worth of the data, they apply their technology and we go straight on from that. It's a fantastic opportunity if you're, if you're a, an early stage investor in these things like I am or, or an explorer in the small X, this is very exciting because you're doing something that hasn't been done before. If it works really well, it'll work great. If it doesn't, it doesn't work. The chances are, we believe, there's an 80% chance of getting large anomalies. Why? Because all the kimberlites in here 
are below Arapa, are south of Arapa. All of them, with one exception, I think it's here, is called BK15, which was an outcropping. Came through the sand. That's one of the Damshire Kimberlites. There's no other ones here at all. They've never found anything because they couldn't see the sand. So every, any geologist, any diamond geologist would say, yep, there are bound to be Kimberlites in here, but just can't find them. So they think there's an 80% chance is the number we're using that we will have anomalies that are likely to be Kimberlites. Hopefully with the geochemical data, the soil sampling data, it will be diamondiferous, and then we go out and prospect. There's a whole lot of ifs there. I'm the first one to say that. But there are very few diamond mines. He said there's only going to be 15 in the world. The new one we have, Karoi, is, is going to be the 16th, but there's some dying out, and hopefully we'll have more there. Very interesting, very good area, very good country to work in. Um, some of you may know it's, it's uh, only a million and a half people. It's about 93% sand. It's very modern. The technologies are very good. It was the poorest country in the world in 1996. It's now one of the richest countries in Africa because of diamonds. 80% of its revenue is diamonds. And um, very good place to work. Good rule. The rule of law applies. You can get a lot of skills. And the infrastructure is quite good. Now, Cameroon. Where and how and why do we end up in the Cameroon? And, and the important thing is, is this here. Oh, I'll, I'll get this right eventually. Good God, sorry about that. We're not ready to go through that. This paleo conglomerate. Until very recently, you only found diamonds in kimberlites or in alluvials. That's all. And that was the rule. And uh, you could not find them anywhere else. Then they found them in lamprorites or something in Australia. Until very recently, the, the, the Beers, I flew over it with the Beers in 2005. They said you can't find worthwhile diamonds in Marangi. These are paleo placers. You don't find diamonds in these. Now, just to put this, a paleo placer is an alluvial. So diamonds came from somewhere, were washed around. The alluvial was compacted over hundreds of millions of years into a really hard conglomerate. And it's really hard and has to be uh, mined. The conglomerate itself has to be mined by explosives. It's not easy to mine. But we, we knew that in Zimbabwe. And then we pick up the fact that there's somebody has discovered diamonds in the Cameroon. Now, Cameroon has no history of diamonds. And yet, a Korean company applied for a diamond mining license in this area called Mobilong. Here, right? A very, very remote area. Three days drive each way from the capital Douala to get there. It's three days drive to get there and then three days back. So if you're using consultants, it's bloody expensive. You know, it costs you six grand to get them there and back before they do a tap of work. It's really very difficult, believe me, and not, not, not good. Just not good. Um, so uh, my colleague David Horgan went out. Off he went. We had been doing some work uh, in, in eastern Cameroon on, on maybe oil licenses, and he went here and had a look. And we used, uh, we got some local people, and using advanced geological techniques known as closeology and trendology. You know, for those of you who have ever made money on property, you walk to the edge of the town and you buy the next field. We walked to the edge of their license and took the next one. And we got an 8,000 square, uh, square kilometre license. Now, an 8,000 square kilometre license in the rainforest is lunacy. Absolute lunacy. If we live to be 110, I'm closer to that than some of you, but if we live to be 110, we couldn't prospect it. We just couldn't. It's all rainforest. And the only roads are logging roads from an Italian company that has a right to take out wood. So what we did is we did the initial sample to discover was the rock the same type as this and would it have the characteristics of, and that's it there, would it have the characteristics that it could contain diamonds? I'll go back a little bit if I'm able to make it go back. We found that, yes, we found that last year. And we started in the last two weeks. We've gone back in here and we have... We are taking bulk samples, small bulk samples, from three areas. We're taking 100 tonnes of each, and we're going to process it. We, we tried to do a deal with these guys, with the Koreans, to use their equipment. They wouldn't allow it. So we've had to ship in our own small plant. And that's, that's being shipped in. So the, the stockpile is being built, and we will sample this and with one objective. We now know the rock type is right. We suspect there are diamonds in it. We want to make sure there are diamonds in it. And... If and when this is, this is um, proven, and we suspect it is, what we will then have to do is a proper bulk sample to estimate grade and quality. Now, I have seen the diamonds. We've been to Korea to see the company, we went to join venture with them. The diamonds are not bad. 
The ones we've seen are not bad. Be good quality, maybe $150, $200 a carat. We have no idea what the grade is. They seem to think it's about 35 carats per 100 tons, the Koreans, but they haven't done that much work. They didn't do that much feasibility study. What they simply did is they bought a plant. They bought a plant in South Africa and shipped it in 40, 40 foot containers to Yaoundé. I, I, I have to get, the, is it Douala, the port, Yaoundé is the port, whichever the port is in the Cameroon. They've then driven it a thousand kilometers into the rainforest and they are assembling a mine which is due to come on stream. Um, so this will happen in the last half of the year, we'll be, we'll be doing a bigger sample. Very interesting area. Um, we're fairly sure we have diamonds. We're not sure about the grade or we're not sure about the quality. May the hems of that. Um, now, Zimbabwe, you will see there's only one page in this. Because in a way, until recently, we've been kind of afraid to say anything. And I have to tell you, there is no value attached to the Botswana diamond share price on anything in Zimbabwe at the moment. Nothing. I mean, its current share price certainly is reflected on Botswana. Cameroon is alien, Zimbabwe. We have three different operations in Zimbabwe. This is uh, the Marangi area here in eastern Zimbabwe, right? It covers 250,000 square kilometers, square um, hectares, 250,000 square hectares. This thing, and you're going to hear a lot about this over the next 10 years, it's a blanket. It lies on top of this area at areas up to maybe a meter or two meters thick. It just lies on top of it. There's some, there's some overburden, but very shallow, and often it's at surface. So you can actually pick up diamonds, believe it or not. You can pick up diamonds on the surface. Our geologist was there and he picked up a five carat diamond, just walking along. It's an amazing thing. Uh, the grades are between 1,500 and 8,000 carats per 100 tons in this area. As, as Robert said, there are 15 concessions, of which four have been awarded. Those four are going to be produce more diamonds than all of Botswana, which is the biggest producer in the world. It'll probably be bigger than Russia in terms of quality, uh, quantity, not qual yeah, and quality maybe as well. Be number one. It won't last forever because you're only mining that, that depth. It's unbelievable. The payback, you're familiar with the payback. The payback is three weeks. I'll give you that number again because you haven't fallen asleep yet. You're not going to, three weeks. You can be in business in there for about $10 million and you get that back easily in three weeks. Now, wherever you have something like that, surprisingly, the politicians get involved. Would that surprise you? Now, not Zimbabwe, not Ireland, not Cameroon, anywhere. There's too much money floating around. So we did the hard work on Marangi some years ago because I've been in Zimbabwe since the 80s. We joint ventured with a local a good uh, company called Farmers World on a 50-50, and we then joint ventured with the state mining company on 50-50. So we'd have a net 25% interest. We applied for a block. We went, got, there are nine checks, nine border checks to get to Morangi, the forbidden zone, as you called it earlier. And we did all of that, and we applied for block. We didn't get it, but we were awarded Block J about two and a half years ago. We signed all the papers, and it's been on the president's desk for a year and a half. Are we going to get it? I think you'd have to assume no. I don't think we will, because there's too much money involved. It looks to me as if the military have taken control of the whole area there. Surprise, surprise. Um, I, uh, yes, it must be shocking to you that such a thing could happen in the world. And um, it looks as if the last concession was done with the uh, Minister for Defences of a guy called Emerson Manangagwa. You know, if that comes, just start buying the shares, I can tell you that. Simple as that. If we do get it and we can actually de develop it, will we? I really don't know. I have to assume there's no value in it. But we were working about 50 kilometres northeast in Matari, overlooking Mozambique. Very beautiful area, but it's mountainous area, so it's not flat like Marangi. And we discovered... Same paleo placers. And we, we went and we got a license, Chimani Mani, a uh, very beautiful place as well. And that's run into trouble. So what have we done there to try and survive? We have given away 100% of it. So we've gone to three local powerful representative groups and they have 100% of it between them. But we have an operating contract for those who have invested in, in exploration, uh, oil exploration companies in the Middle East. We've done a PSA, Production Sharing Agreement. So we've said to them, we'll build it, we'll operate it, we'll pay all the costs, we'll give you 75% of the revenue. You don't have to, of the revenue. We'll take 25% of the revenue. That's the deal we have on that. Will it happen? 
supposedly going to happen. Again, attaching no value to it at this particular stage. It's possible. We put, Botswana Diamonds put about a half a million dollars worth of equipment into Zimbabwe, and the assumption we were going to get this license, and we didn't. So we've gone down here now to Bite Bridge. Again, some of you will know there are two mines down there, the old River Ranch Diamond Mine, which has been owned by all kinds of people in Zimbabwe. In fact, multiple ownership of the same mine. A couple of hundred percent of the shares were floating around, I think. Um, we have never been caught on that one. And the Rio Tinto Mine, the Moroi Diamond Mine, down here, near Bite Bridge. Um, we've taken old Rio Tinto claims, and we've, um, we actually started, we're sampling, we're bulk sampling them now, in a small way. Uh, we hope that they will contain diamonds. So we've quite a lot of activity, and as I said, I think it's opening up. This is the team, um, fine bunch of young men. Sorry, no ladies, but we will find diamond ladies. Um, the three of us are the ones that have been involved for a long number of years in a variety of companies. Robert is only learning the joys of, of uh, early stage infant exploration companies. And Andre Free has been with us for a long time. Uh, he, he spends about half of his time with us. We will be adding a new director very quickly, uh, shortly on, on that. I think that's the story, um, and I'll take questions afterwards. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>